Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi, we'll explore how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. And we have a special returning guest co-host, Elliot Pepper. Hey, Elliot. Hi, thanks so much for having me back on. Elliot Pepper writes books, and he talks about Minority Report sometimes on our podcast, but we got something else going on today. Elliot, you have a new book, don't you? I do. Yeah, it just came out a couple days ago. How convenient. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what is it? Uh, it's called Borderless. It's a science fiction thriller about a sort of refugee turned secret agent who's uh, sort of navigating the geopolitical labyrinth as tech platforms rise and nation states start to crumble. And uh, it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun. But today, we watched a movie. What movie do we watch? Sorry to bother you. Oh, it's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make time for Elliot. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. We're going to spoil the movie. What is Sorry to Bother You about? So, listeners be warned. Um, this, this is a movie where, spoiler alert, you should pay attention to them. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I guess uh, and you seem to really appreciate this movie, too. So I'm comfortable if you wanted to make a note like, this is really good. Watch it first or something like that if you need that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, if, if I would recommend for folks uh, who are interested in this movie, I would watch the movie first and then listen to our conversation because uh, be, just because I know that when I watched it, I really loved it, and I wouldn't have wanted some of the surprise plot twists to sort of have been uh, uh, told me in advance. Yeah, and I think the the reveal was part of my enjoyment to a large degree. Yeah, and if you told me what was going to happen, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I thought you'd be lying <laughs> right. to me. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. <laughs> there yeah. you go. Yeah, I actually, when I watched this film, um, I, I tried to go in without a lot of preconceptions, and I'm really glad I did. And um, you'll, I think you'll find, if you do that and you check out the movie, that you will then really want to listen to this discussion that we're about to have, because there is a lot, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, and, and it left me thinking about the film for days after I watched it. That's a sign of a good thing. That's what we like to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. So what's it about, man? We could spoil. Now that now we've given sufficient disclaimer. Yeah. So um, so sorry to bother you is a it's an adventure film. It's an adventure film that takes place in a sort of dystopic near future San Francisco Bay Area. And specifically, it takes place in Oakland, which is actually not only where I live, but where I was born and raised. Um, so uh, it was a lot of fun for me seeing all of the uh, scenes that are were filmed and set here. And uh, it follows Cassius, or his big name's Cash, um, who who is sort of uh, you know unemployed and struggling, and he manages to get a job for this sort of hegemonic, huge corporation called Worry Free, and uh, and and he has a really telemarketing job for them, and that's sort of how the movie kicks off. And then some weird stuff happens. Like, how do you even? How could you even summarize it in a pithy couple sentences? It's, right? it's tough. I mean, like if, if I wanted to do the elevator pitch for this movie, I would I would say that it's a science fiction film that looks at the absurdities that are so present in American society today. I love how pumped up you are about this. I can see, obviously, that you've been like holding this in since you saw the movie two months ago or whatever. Yeah, no, I mean, so... Okay, so here's something that's really interesting about this film that I think uh, that that he commented on that that I think would be that listeners might get a kick out of, and that I I, I it meant a lot to me. Um, so, if you re once you watch this film, you will understand why a lot of people talk about how it embodies a lot of current issues that you're seeing in the headlines all the time. So you see all of these reflections of so many of the things that I think not just Oakland, but our country are really struggling with right now in terms of inequality, in terms of, you know, what, how do we find good, you know, good jobs for people at a time when technology is really changing so much of the economy? Like, how do we build a future that's more inclusive? How do we build a future that's kinder and that, you know, actually gives people the opportunities they need rather than commoditizing their lives, right? And if you're on the bottom of that pyramid, like 
what do you do, right? Like if you, if, if all the systems around you are structured to disempower you, how do you take action? How do you avoid just being fatalistic about everything? Because you have, everyone is giving you every excuse to do so. But even though, like, if you not only watch the film and think about it, even if you read all the, whatever critics have to say about this film and like why it matters and why it connects to all these real world issues, right? I was really interested when someone asked Boots Riley, like, why did you make this movie, right? Like, what, like, what are you trying to accomplish with this movie? And I was really expecting an answer that was really focused on what we just talked about, right? Like, I have a message, and I want to find a way to get that message out to the world. But his answer was very different than that. His answer was, look, when I was growing up, I adored movies like Indiana Jones and Star Wars. Right. Like, and he's, and he's like, you know, I have issues, I may have issues with them now, but when I was a kid, those movies meant a lot to me. Um, and, and there, there's something really special about adventure stories because, you know, what they allow you to do, if you think about sort of what's at the heart of Star Wars, what's at the heart of Indiana Jones, it's, he said, you know, it's about new worlds opening up. It's about you're telling a story about new worlds opening up for the characters, right? And for the audience. And that that has this sort of innately human appeal that we 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 want to experience a sense of wonder. We want to uh, ex- explore, you know, see a world, see a universe that's bigger than ourselves. And that when he tries to tell stories, whether it's just story to bother you or, you know, any of the other scripts he's working on, that's what he's after. But that's actually what he's focused on is how can I tell this story that is moving and that speaks to, you know, some internal truth, but that also really gives that sense of adventure that you want to keep watching it, that it's compelling, that, that it's fun and that it, you know, it has a sense of humor and that it helps open up a new world before your eyes. And I thought that was just uh, a really beautiful sentiment, especially when, especially coming from someone who has made a, uh, a film that is very politically charged in a good way, right? Um, that, that he looks at the creative process fr- from that angle. I thought it was really refreshing and really cool. And I think you're talking about adventure, but more than that, maybe that I'm noticing is that science fiction is the perfect way to do this sort of thing. It always has been, and the best science fiction is that. It's something that can shake your perceptions out of their normal routine and make you look at what is actually a very relevant human social story or whatever in a context that you would not have otherwise identified with or recognized or been interested in. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I always like to say that, you know, uh, by by like allowing, by inv- like, allowing us to experience these plausible alternative realities that science fiction actually allows us to shine a new light on our own reality. Right. And I think that that's a big, a a big power. I think that there's something, there's something really special um, that you can do when you're working in an imaginary space, right? It suddenly frees people uh, from the baggage that we have when we talk about certain issues in the real world, right? Because like we all, we all have our personal histories. We're all going to bring that to the table. And I think that um, when you write a science fiction story that where the the whole world is intentionally imaginary, right? Or there are these big changes to the world, which make it clearly fictional. Suddenly we're able to engage with that world in a, in a, in a, more childlike way, right? Like we're actually able to like go back to first principles and not bring all of our own crap to bear on it. Um, and, and that is very, very powerful. I, I, I always think of uh, reading or watching science fiction as being very analogous to international travel. That when you get off a plane in a country where you don't speak the language, you you have no choice but to look at it with like fresh eyes, right? Like, I mean, you have to like figure out where the bathroom is. You have to figure out, you know, how to buy food and stuff like that. And so you're, you're really looking at all of these things that normally you'd ignore. And that's a very exciting 
experience. Like that's, it can be scary, right? It, it can be overwhelming, but it's exciting. I think that is the internal emotional experience of having a new world open up for you, right? But from my perspective, the most interesting part about international travel is actually when you get off the plane back at home, right? Because when you get off the plane back at home after you've gone to a country that you'd never visited before, suddenly you start realizing all of the weird assumptions that you were taking for granted before, right? Like you, you look at your own life, you look at, um, you, you look at even things as simple as like the way that public transportation happens to function in your city to get you home from the airport. And suddenly you look at that in a new light because you just saw that all of the things that we implicitly take for granted in the worlds we live in every day, there are choices embedded in that, right? Like there are choices embedded in, for example, here in the Bay Area, we have a really crappy subway system that was built decades ago called BART. Um, it's really different than if you go to Hong Kong, right? Like, and it's very different than if you go to Mexico City. And so suddenly something that has become invisible to me when I come home from a different place becomes visible again. And it forces me to take a look at it from a new angle. I think that science fiction does that virtually, right? Like, like what are these kinds of stories? Like they're, we're, we're, they're, they're the theater of the mind, right? Like we are, we are vicariously traveling to new universes, to new worlds through these stories. And we're traveling inside other people's hearts and minds, right? And, and I think that that is one of the biggest gifts that, that science fiction can give us, whether it's a movie or a book or a comic book or whatever it is that, you know, piques your fancy, um, that uh, it gives us this rush, it gives us this adventure, it gives us this escape. But in escaping, we actually can see something new about ourselves. Like, I think we mentioned that the Megacorp, like Amma, Google, Facebook, whatever, in the movie is actually genetically modifying the workers to better exploit them. But without, we didn't actually touch it. Like they're actually turning them into, they use the word equisapiens in the movie. Cause I guess somebody's probably listening to this without having seen the movie still. They turn them into equisapiens. They turn them into horse people. Um, and so we're taking all these things. Like you'd hear the movie might mention something about the wealth gap and inequality and like workers' rights and, and labor. And you just go in one ear, go through your processor and come out the other because you already have, like you've made judgments on these terms already. You have ideas about these things already. Mm. But then the movie comes in, it's like horse and you're like, hold on a minute, right. tell me more. <laughs> this changes things. It's 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 so silly almost, but then was actually so effective in doing that thing, in changing your approach to what you thought you knew already. That's reframing your familiar context. Yeah, man. And all of a sudden it's kind of juxtaposed and taken to the side. Like, I don't know. Did everyone else hear the first thing you thought of when they brought out the horse? <laughs> did everyone else think of HD walls like right away when we got to the manipulation uh, uh, the the breeding of the workers. No, I'm the only one. I didn't, but I really appreciated the reference. <laughs> no, I, I was like, when when you were talking about it earlier, yeah, I was like, that's messed up. <laughs> oh, well, first you should yeah. think that's messed up. That's a good person would do that. And then second, you yeah. might go, this reminds me of Doctor Moreau. And I think this this fits perfectly with what we're getting at about like the appropriateness of science fiction to this sort of task because he was doing the same thing in 1895, yeah, or whatever it may have been, yeah, where he was like, I'm a Newton bitter. Let's hold on a second and look at, like, let's consider what we're doing with this science stuff before we hurt people. And in the one story, at least, manifests as the monsters on the island, on the island of Dr. Moreau, spoiler alert for the book from 150 years ago, um, versus right here, where we have a very similar dynamic, I thought. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a really appropriate reference. And, you know, I think H.G. Wells is a great example. I mean, he, like he pushed so many boundaries, like he helped define what science fiction is. Right. And, 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 and like, there's sort of this interesting thing. Like I feel like so often genre is associated with its props, the tropes of it. Right. So like, for example, like when people think of science fiction, they think of like spaceships or, you know, like things like, like space opera often when people think of fantasy, they often think of like swords, Magic, dragons, and yeah, magic—all this kind of stuff—and um, 
And I think that it can sometimes be surprising, especially like, like obviously people who love science fiction know that there's a lot more going on than props, right? But I think that for, for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with science fiction, that's their main association with it, right? And they don't realize that uh, so much of what I think is some of the mo most uh, cutting and effective social commentary in the past 150 years, as you said, has come from science fiction. Um, I think that's a really interesting component because, I mean, I love space operas. I love Star Wars. I love huge adventurous stories that use the prop, the traditional props of science fiction. And I also love seeing a movie like this, where when that moment happened, where, you know, he wanders into that bathroom and suddenly there's this crazy horse person. I was like, what the f is this movie? Right? Like what is going on? Like, like not only did it change what was happening in the story, it changed my relationship to the movie as a member of the audience. And I can't remember the last time that's happened to me during a film. And like at the time, I was like, I don't even know what to think about this, right? Like I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's going on. I, I just found that to be a very fascinating experience as a moviegoer. That's what it takes to jar you out of complacency these days. Yeah, I guess so. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what you guys think of the film. Like I feel like I went into the film with because it's about my hometown, it's in my hometown, like I'm coming at it from a really specific perspective. I want to hear what it was like for you guys to watch the film. What did, what stood out to you? What was most surprising? What, what did you come, when you left the movie, what did it leave you thinking about afterwards? I'm not the right person to ask this question. I don't know. Do you have human things? <laughs> <laughs> I am a person. Yes. You know what I mean though, right? Like, look at the, this podcast. We're out of our comfort zone when we get into something like this, usually, because most of the time uh, I have trouble identifying with a lot of the human story things. Less you, but maybe a little bit of the same thing. And that's why we wind up being like, this movie's about something. Who knows? Anyway, rocks in space. <laughs> Or like, <laughs> you were okay. Okay, so no, that that's actually fascinating in itself, though. So, so I'm that sort of person. Yeah. So when you watch a film, what do you most identify with, or what gets you most excited? Why do you like the films you like? Oh, I enjoy them for how they make me think about something in a way that I hadn't before. Often, in the analytical enjoyment sense. Uh, what was the thing? Interstellar, whatever. That's a really famous movie. It's not going to surprise anybody. But in the examination of that movie, we actually learned a lot about different things that we hadn't thought about in that manner. It seems like, oh, whatever wormholes, you've heard those before. But at the end of the day, we have these small revelations in the way we think about an aspect of how the universe works that we hadn't approached. And there was no reason to approach until the movie did something silly and we had to bend over backwards to try to understand what might be happening. Ah, okay. I like it. That yeah. So really, how it like how it reveals something fascinating about the universe, right, or about the world that's external to the character's experience, but is very much a part of the film. Yeah, it's where I get my energy is having some new understanding of something that I didn't have before. It's usually what I'm looking for most of the time. The emotional real engagement is too far a thing to hope for, but it happens sometimes. Well. What in Story to Bother You made you think about something in the world that wasn't about the character's journey, but that was a surprise to you? One of the things I hadn't thought about was the actual explanation of a white voice, because I was familiar with the concept of sounding white, but not necessarily with all of the non-baggage that it entails, essentially. You know, you're right. That was like the best part of the whole movie for me, too. Because that's, that, I guess, me being white, it's not something I, tech, I usually think about is people sound a certain way. And, you know, that's there's less, um, I guess, context usually involved with that. We hadn't thought about that before. I think not having to think about it is exactly the point. Yes, totally. Because what they say in the movie, it was talk with your white voice. It was, it was the best part of the whole thing. Danny Glover's explaining. Here's how the white voice works. And he yeah. says, I already sound white. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I, I think I'm putting on, you know, like what would be the equivalent of a posh accent. I'm, I'm speaking in the uh, like common American vernacular, vernacular language, but they call it code switching, the linguistic term. I actually thought about calling in your friend Nick Farmer, but I forgot until it was too late. 
our mutual friend now. <laughs> yeah. Our, our resident linguist. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but so my, my lay explanation, however, in situations where people speak multiple languages or multiple dialects of a language, what we'll call code switching is the habit, the tendency, the ability to switch, even within one conversation, switch language contexts, so to speak. So that uh, I will, well, you know what? Yeah, really. I'll speak differently with work than I would if I go back to my family in Brooklyn. Or uh, someone, especially who speaks, uh, what would you call it? Colloquial black American English might switch their mode of speech when they go to work as a telemarketer, as in the movie, where you would switch to your white voice as much as possible. It's uh, it's changing the dressing for how people are going to perceive you and understand you linguistically. Because there is still this perception, misperception, in, well, yeah, in America that non-standard, so to speak, English, non-white English is like less than. That these other dialects of English around the country, and especially that one maybe, are are not as expressive or useful or good. It creates this utility in switching back and forth on context, which it's a cool thing that we can do even when our other dialect doesn't have baggage. It's a thing we can do. It's a good tool. But the sad thing about it is that it sort of puts down these these other dialects that are a part of a culture because they are not they're not seen as good enough in some context. Yeah, I think that's that's right on, right? And I think that, you know, everyone listening does this every day, right? Like you said, like you you're gonna speak differently and act differently around your coworkers than you will around your family, right? Like all of us probably in high school acted differently with our peers than we did with our grandparents. Yeah. Right? I don't um, know if there's another term for it sociologically or whatever, but I think you can even apply that term. That code switch should very well. Yeah. It's a very useful concept even beyond linguistics and in general behavior, right. like you were saying. Right. I mean, because remember that like language is more than words, right? So like even, you know, body language is such a huge part of how we communicate, right? Like, uh, and, and behavior, like the actions we take are also a form of communication. So I, I think that it very much just, you know, we, uh, when you communicate, the style in which you do tell someone about what groups you are affiliating yourself with, right? And, and so we all do this every day. But the thing that we don't think about every day. And I think, you know, the really critical piece that you just highlighted is that word standard, right? So like standard American English. And I hope that came across in my speaking. I was putting up big old finger quotes. Exactly. <laughs> right. No, no, no. That's what I mean. I think you're spot on. And, and the, you know, no, like la there is no such thing as standard language. Like there is, there's a certain sense that there's standard language and that we have to be mutually intelligible, right? Like if I just start making up words, you're not going to know what I'm talking about. But um, standard, like defining one code, right? If you're going to talk about code switching, defining one code of standard is actually a, it's a, a hidden and invisible power structure, Right. Um, and you, you're you're defining one thing as the basis of everything else. And it does it in this setting, which is sales, basically, where right. you do have to speak to an audience. Uh, it's just it picks the most dreary not to put anybody down who does like this and maybe you enjoy it. But like, I've done it. It's it was the worst time I ever had in my life, maybe like as a professional of anything was doing the telemarketing, like in the movie. And and that's actually how it's portrayed, too. It's soul-sucking. Everyone hates it there. Yeah, I mean, I think that so much of this movie is about what it means to dehumanize someone, right? So that happens literally in the movie yeah. where, <laughs> you know, worry-free is turning people into crazy horse mutants. But I think that in many ways, the or in some ways anyway, the most disturbing aspect of it is the beginning, right? Where, where that same process is at work, it's just invisible, right? Where like worry-free has so effectively turned its employees into commodities that it no longer treats or sees them as people. That that's a lot of what this movie is about, right? It's about how systems, uh, how we've built some of the systems we built really dehumanize people and the results are 
tragic. Oh, that's reflected in the media in the movie again, too. Also, mostly in the beginning. Like, look at what is on the bar, on the TV in the bar. It's the lowest of the lowest of the lowest common denominator media. What's the show? Do we have an idea what it was called? Because it was, if you remember Idiocracy, it was Out My Balls. I think it's, I got the, I got the sh- kicked out of me. Or something this show like was that. called I Got the sh- Kicked Out of Me? Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it really points out, like, how how the media we consume really shapes our, our worldviews that, you know, it, I mean, what we read about is what we have to think about, right? Like what we watch, like we're, that's our media diet, just like we have a physical diet that fuels our bodies. Right. And a media diet that in addition to our personal experiences shapes our minds and our way of thinking. Keep in mind though, that's like, this is the mass media. And I hope, I, yes. obviously, I see what they're doing in the movie, but I hope in our real life, optimistically, that more and more people can learn how to find their community and how to find healthy inputs, because they're there now, like on the internet, rather than Channel 7 or whatever it is. Right. This is definitely broadcast media. Because that's the lowest common denominator is, it, the dumbest possible thing to apply to the most people possible, when you can actually find the stimulating thing for you. Right. And I actually think there are some really good examples of that in this film as well. Um, Detroit, uh, Cash's girlfriend. Oh, right. um, Yeah. Isn't she's, she's an artist. Right. And that is like, that is a physical example of non broadcast media, right. Where people are forming a community around something that is incredibly niche, but that is, very meaningful to them. Right. And I think that there are other, I mean, in, in some ways, like, I feel like the forming of these new communities, whether it's like for an art gallery performance (laughs) or whether it's for, you know, the, the union of telemarketers, right. Like that, 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 um, expression of like telling the, telling the truth as you see it and, and, uh, and trying to find like-minded people, uh, that you can connect with because of that truth. I think that that's a really positive aspect of this film where so many of the big picture issues are very dystopian. Um, the the immediate action and we the drama we see between characters that's positive is often about that, right? It's about how those tight connections and friendships and that, that can be formed around this stuff happen. In real life too. And I'm watching you. You aren't a mass market paperback guy. You seem to have found your audience at I, as much as it looks dark in real life, as much as it did in the movie. I can point to someone like you or something like us to a lesser degree, and these other things that are the the smaller the community, the more everyone's able to like hold each other up in a way that the mass market is just too many people to be able to do it. I don't want to feel so negative about the whole thing because I'm watching the good version of it play out. It's kind of hard to not feel like you're on a sinking ship with a bucket, though. <laughs> it's a, well, because you look at scale and everything is raised to the bottom. Yeah, so I think you're both right. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the interesting contradiction that that is true today is that, it, like, what this movie is about, the content of this movie, highlights all of this sort of structural injustice and yet the meta story of the movie itself is that Sorry to Bother You would never have gotten made 30 years ago. Yeah, good point. Right? Like this movie is an example. Like the movie itself is an example of a community coming together to make a movie that is this f- crazy, right? Like, like it was hard. Like it, like boots worked so hard to just get the script written, get it financed, get this movie made. And they found the right people. And when the movie came out, it struck a chord with a very specific community of, of fans, right? Like in a way that Hollywood would never in a million years have greenlit this kind of a film, right? Like that, that's just, it, like, there's no way in hell. This isn't a top-down movie. It's a bottom-up movie. In the best way, right? Like, it is, it's, it, like, that is the, the, the counterexample. Like, or, you know, that's, that's the beauty of it. And I think that 
that is if you want to seek out sort of hope for how how you can do awesome things in media or sort of like where things are going like i think that's where the interesting action is right so in addition to, so for example as a counterpoint to all like so many mass media outlets broadcast media outlets you have incredible people building audiences on places like patreon where you, if you make a web comic which there is no way there's no traditional way you could ever even monetize a web comic um you know, people are donating monthly to people making web comments where now they're making a living to make this thing that this small group of people care about, but they don't just like it. They love it. They love it so much that they will do whatever is necessary to help make that thing possible in the world. Right. And I think that is what is exciting. Like, that's what the Internet has changed about media for the worse and for the better. Right. And I think that. Uh, I want to see more movies get made in the way that Sorry to Bother You was made, right? Like, I think that that is an example of people who whose voices would be structurally silenced seizing the moment to actually get their voice heard. I think that's awesome, right? So, um, you know, I, I think that although there is a lot of nihilism in a, in a certain way, like on behalf of the, some of the characters in the movie, that the meta story of the movie itself is a message of hope, right? Is a message that we can take action to not only make the world, world a better place, but also to try to make more of the things we love in the world, to support the things we love in the world. That's, that that is the mechanism for making it a better place. I love that this is ringing as true with you as it is for me. Because this is our pitch at the end of every episode is we have a bunch of people supporting our show. Here they are and thank you. But the ultimate pitch isn't give us the money because that's not what's most important. It's support what you love in general, whatever it is. Absolutely. And I mean, if it, OK, so for any listeners who are both movie fans, because obviously they, they love this podcast, they listen to it, but who also might be making something themselves or whoever have thought of making something themselves, I highly recommend Googling 1000 true fans. Great. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's a short essay by a guy named Kevin Kelly who helped create why he was the original editor in chief at wired magazine among many other things. And it's a lovely essay that cogently sort of like sums up this dynamic. And think of when this was written too. Oh, uh, when, what, like 15, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, right. Before we had Patreon, et cetera. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, now, I guess if you read it now, maybe it, it just feels like a description of reality rather than... <laughs> no, but it's great. Think of that prescience, right? That he saw this coming. These platforms didn't yet exist, but we were getting there. Right. And like, as a novelist, like, I know that I would way rather have 10 people, 10 readers that just love my books right like like that just absolutely adore them and like want to get the next book i write on the day it comes out or you know like they want to they, they have questions that they want answered about the characters about you know whatever i would rather have 10 of those people than a thousand casual readers now don't get me wrong i love casual readers too but like <laughs> if 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 forced to choose if forced to choose i would way rather create something that a small number of people love than a large number of people like right on and i think that that is what the internet is, is doing i mean it's it's making that possible in a way that has never been possible before yeah not but not even just the internet the web these and these this combination of vary of variously open and closed platforms that we're able to exploit to reach each other in this manner. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean, like, you know, the way that I even w discovered this movie in the first place is because of that. Right. Not because I was supporting media, but because I was using media to support a tiny local nonprofit because I discovered them on the Internet and really believe in their mission. Be the change you want to see in the world. There you go. That's the end of the movie.
I guess. The movie that we talked about at length. And there's a horse purse in the <laughs> uprising. Yeah, there's something about horses. And, uh, and that's the end of the movie. What did we learn? I learned to celebrate and look optimistically at the uh, the establishment of communities. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that the the tools are what we make with them, right? Like, you can take the internet or anything else. You can take capitalism. You know, you can take our economic system and you can turn it into worry-free. Right. Like if you choose to uh, to look at the world like sort of end times are nigh and you're scared and greedy. Right. Like if that's how you choose to do it, you can create dystopia. But dystopia is a choice. Right. So, you know, my takeaway from this movie is like. Be more conscious, be more conscious of the choices I am making, be more conscious of the quote unquote, standard American English that I'm speaking, right? Be more conscious of the ways in which our world is shaped to favor those in power and to disempower a lot of other people, right? And and see what I can do to change that. Right on. And so recom- recommended related stuff, we were talking about the code switching, which is my favorite part of the movie. There's a video that I'll put in the show notes that was Key and Peele doing an Obama meet and greet where he was code switching. I don't think they use the word in the skit, but as he switches between white and black people, as he's meeting them, he code switches in a hilarious way. And it's a good comedy skit. I mean, when you explain a joke, it's not funny anymore, but in the show notes with that one, the other thing though, one more is Elliot wrote another book. Elliot. That, yeah, that's right. What's uh, up with your book? What? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's called Borderless. Um, it's out this week. Um, it's a lot of fun. Again, it's about a, uh, a rogue spy and it's sort of, uh, hopefully if you enjoy sorry to bother you, you'll enjoy this book because like Mabuvi, it really tries to ask hard questions about some of the invisible systems that shape our lives. Like the countries we live in, the laws we live with, the tech platforms and, and technology that we use every day and sort of what, what that means for our future. So I would imagine that if you got a kick out of this movie, um, you might get a kick out of the book. Yeah. I appreciate that you're thoughtful about this sort of thing in a way that we don't normally approach. So I'm really happy to have you here and share this again, because you're really good at this sort of thing and you do weave in real ideas into your science fiction work. And then that's good. I like it. Yeah, I, I love chatting with you guys about this stuff, too. I mean, I always think of myself as a reader first and a writer second. And I guess the same would be true, you know, in film, right? Like, I'm a fan, and then I like to make stuff, too. And uh, and so it's always a joy to get to geek out about the things I love. Where should people go to find out about your books? Yeah, myname.com. If you just Google my name, uh, E-L-I-O-T-P-E-P-E-R, it'll pop up. Yeah, um, Eli Peeper. Uh, books are, yeah. Um, yeah, the books are available everywhere. So, you know, if, again, if you just like, uh, if you Google borderless or Google my name, um, it'll pop up. And, uh, you know, as we've sort of talked about, I, I, I love hearing from, from people who love my work, just I, like, I love talking about people who, whose, whose work I love. So, uh, if you, if you read borderless or any of my other books and you really connect with it, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Considering how we're appreciating this whole like internet creative ecosystem that we've established. The ability for communities to cohere here and be more than the common denominator and here. speak to each other. Here, here. I want to I wanna, I wanna thank our supporters. They're, I dare say, the best people on the internet. And there's a new one. Soon to be one of a thousand true fans. Yeah, we're getting there, man. Working on it. We have a new one who has not yet been like, it's cool to talk about me and say my name. So just know that there's an awesome new person. It's a mysterious benefactor. But here are these people, Terrence Lee, Joe Ferraro, Daniel the Antmonder, Jeremy the Top Poster, Adrian Mihail the Dinosaur Hunter, Ellen Michael Pools, Equus Sapien Superman, Robert the Roaster, Dean at LSG Media, Andy P of Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Andrew Capitulo of the Mighty, Jeff Farmish Wardman, Harry Horse Nipples Chris Kennard. Does he have two or is it like more? How many? What are Horse Nipples like? I hope you wind up Deviant Art. <laughs> <laughs> What was the Dothraki fermented mare's milk called, Chris? No idea. I don't know, but real life uh, fermented milk products, fermented dairy, which is made from horse milk for like the Mongols. Asian steps in general were down with the fermented milk, kumis, or some other variation on that general word. I guess there's kefir as well, 
which in much of the world, not America, is an alcoholic beverage. Oh, I was not familiar with kefir being alcoholic. It's You should understand that to be, as a standard alcoholic, in the way that cider is standard alcoholic, though in America it tends to be a soft drink, so we have it our way. In general, alcoholic. For the kefir, it's not mare's milk, but the horse milk one, kumis. We sure got off track. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? Back back to the people, Colbert. Michael, the Giants Peterson, Samu Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Josh F and G of LSG Media, Mr. Ray Gun Curly Phil, Tema Sikama, his arms wide, John Wares, Kumis enthusiast Matt Greek. It's kind of a shame. I mean, it's great, actually, that we've managed to breed cows in the manner that we have, that they are so, so very productive with the milk thing. But it's kind of a shame as far as now a lot of people, probably most people in the United States, let's even say, I'm, I'm presuming, haven't had other milks besides cow milk. And you can get pretty easily. There's there's goat, sheep. Soy, almond. That, those the, <laughs> soy, Soybeans don't have nipples, Colbert. <laughs> they're very small. <laughs> I wish we had a different word for those because they're totally not. <laughs> they, we should have a different classific- classification because that actually is. It shouldn't be. And that that's why it's a problem. It shouldn't be confusing. But people are actually confused about what milk is. In the category of I can put cereal and use it with it and then be happy with the end product, I'm mm-hmm. happy with that. Right. But you know what I think is happening here is that separation of people from where the food comes from, where you might actually have a thing of milk is just this opaque food category with no consideration of where it actually comes from in the manner that like a kid might not understand at a certain point, like the chicken is the meat of an animal, like it's its muscles from a thing that we killed. The milk is just, oh, it's the white stuff in a jar. And that makes it okay to classify somehow almond and soy water alongside. Uh, oh, dude, this is a great podcast right here. Are we recording? Well, I don't know why you went <laughs> off the rails. I, want, I don't remember. And back to the people. And our Kobe FF Joe Ruppel, Luke Bailey, Bug Eater, Stark Naked, Equisapian Eli Avron. He fit right in. A large Dragon Gunner superhero. Daniel James Barker of Uncertainty Principle, the podcast. H. Falcone of this podcast sometimes. John, champion of Equicastorian Beavers. DJ Horse <laughs> Moffat. And my mom and grandma, Judy. A magical genetic monstrosity human hybrid unicorn, Julian Creighton. Thanks, everybody, for supporting the show. On our way to a thousand true fans. Sally Forth. So everyone else, please support your creators online. Elliot, us, whoever's making a thing you like, consider helping to make their thing. If we're the thing you want to support, decipher sci-fi.com to support the show. <laughs> That's a 10. You know what else is a 10? I got to keep that in now. Yeah, <laughs> you do. <laughs> Spreading the word and helping others find us. Send them over to decipher sci-fi.com slash subscribe. And thank you for coming on, Elliot. Yeah, thank you. As much as I was saying, like, I don't like to bother you. So this one's been a long time coming. Quick, write another book. You already did. <laughs> oh, wait, you already did. <laughs> Quick, publish another book. <laughs> it's in May. There we go. It'll happen. Thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks, guys. Good evening. Bam. Vanilla butt juice.